Hey, it's Russ Curtis, a licensed clinical mental health counselor and professor of counseling in the west in the mountains of Western North Carolina. I hope you are not hearing all the um, leaf blowers as we have this beautiful fall going on, but that's what I'm listening to. I have posted on this before. It's definitely a trend that counselors and other uh, psychotherapists need to be aware of is the use of psychedelics in mental health treatment. This is an article that we published in the Journal of Mental Health Counseling. By the way, top-notch journal, pro, pros running that place, uh, and what I mean by that are really, really skilled editors. So if you're a researcher, I think it's a good journal to um, maybe submit work to, and if you are a clinician, a great one to subscribe to. And of course, I'm not sponsored in any way, but I've always appreciated that working with them. All right, psychedelic assisted therapy, clearly a trend, one that behavioral health professionals need to know about. Now, we covered three in this paper. We covered psilocybin, which you may know as mushrooms. We covered MDMA, some uh, colloquially known as ecstasy. And then also ketamine, which uh, is a, a, a veterinarian anesthetic used in veterinary sciences. Um, we covered these three really good research showing how it is quickly effective, rapidly effective in treating depression and suicidal ideation. Not 100% foolproof, but it certainly um, has um, some good results. And there's federal trials being conducted at this time to look at it even further. Okay, the first one, this is the only one that is currently legal uh, with, a, with a medical doctor prescription, is ketamine, which they rebranded as a nasal spray and call it ES ketamine or S ketamine. Um, it, so I just wanted to make you aware of that, that that one is legal with an MD prescription and does have uh, research supporting its efficacy in treating uh, depression and suicidal ideation. For behavioral health professionals, this is called psychedelic assisted therapy. The behavioral health component is critical. And I'm going to talk about some steps that are needed and that counselors and psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists can play in helping clients. Now, first of all, this is not the only one that's legal is the ketamine. And um, so if you are not to help somebody do something illegal, uh, uh, psilocybin and MDMA is still a, uh, considered a narcotic and uh, cannot be prescribed at this time. So you can't help people with that. But if as approval comes through, you may be asked to assist with the medical community in helping clients process this. So. The first thing is you may be called to assess, and generally what they're saying right now is people that have had past um, uh, uh, schizophrenic episodes, um, schizoaffective uh, episodes, this is not deemed a good treatment at this time. Now, it may be a good treatment at some point. They may find in the research that it actually is very helpful for people with severe and persistent mental illness. But that's where assessment can play a role here is that we can use some of the things that we're learning about, um, you know, the different assessment instruments out there, even the big five indicator that can give you profiles for such as, you know, paranoid personality disorder, um, the GAD7 for anxiety, the PHQ9 for depression. I've got some uh, that, that we use that are kind of special here at Western Carolina. Um, but you may have your own, I, I think the SASE, for instance, uh, the Substance Abuse Subtle Screen Inventory is a good one for uh, substance abuse. So just know that using your assessment skills and assessment tools can be helpful in providing information prior to a client when this is approved um, using this, you know, under good guidance and, you know, the purity of, of what's being given, which is only done in clinical trials right now. All right, another thing that behavioral health professionals can help with is the set. And what that means is, uh, let's say you are in an approved clinical trial and you're working with a medical team and somebody is going to be given a dose of psilocybin. Prior to that happening, you can help them determine what they want their setting to be like. So are they going to lay down on a couch? Do they want blankets? Do they want flowers? Do they want incense? Do they want essential oils? What kind of lighting? Typically, the way the trials are, there are two behavioral health professionals watching them and with them in the same room at all times during the trial. 
but helping them develop what would be the proper set because intention appears to be really important in the uh, how how the patient interacts with the drugs, how the client interacts is their intent. This is why it can be dangerous and is dangerous to use you know, at a party or at a uh, concert where maybe the intention's unclear, maybe the people who are uh, illegally giving a dose, uh, you know, are unclear as to why they're doing that too. Then using person-centered counseling. Now, there's typically not a lot of talk during the process while somebody is being administered the substance, but afterwards helping them make meaning of their experiences is a part of the behavioral health profession and we can use good person-centered skills to where we are empathic, we're congruent, we're authentic with our clients, we're reframing what they said uh, and, and reframing um, so that they feel listened to. Um, that's just, just beefing up on your basic but incredibly powerful person-centered counseling skills is a part of this. Knowledge of transcendent experiences. So you do need to be aware of what are common transcendent experiences. And I'll give you one way you can look at this is on YouTube. There are videos about people that have had near-death experiences because that's not uncommon for folks to experience um, that they feel like they've left their body. Uh, that they see their physical body from a distance, but they feel kind of disembodied, um, that uh, you'll hear about a tunnel of light, you'll hear about kind of life review, um, that people meet relatives that have passed, uh, they meet people they don't know that have passed, guides, um, spiritual figures, and so forth. So making sure that you're aware of that so that you're not shocked by revelations or what people are saying while they are undergoing the federally approved trial. Um, also know the common negative experiences because that can be frightening for folks to feel disembodied, to feel like they're losing themselves, to feel like it's a free fall experience and, you, and boy, am I just losing everything. So we need to understand these common experiences that clients can view at least initially as negative or frightening. Um, I think it's also important to understand when I say post-colonial considerations is why has this not been, this was a common treatment throughout many cultures for a long time, and why is, uh, why are we just now coming back to the fact that this may be very helpful? And, you know, questions we can ask ourselves is, you know, how has it, people experience oneness, sometimes they experience oneness when they do this, and you know, does is, is this something that um, religious figures uh, that maybe with not the best intentions, they don't want you to know that you can experience this without the use of a specific religion or church or membership or what have you. Also, financial considerations are related to this. You know, why does... Um, why would, you know, Big Pharma and other medical communities not want people to uh, have relief from depression? Now, I don't mean to feed conspiracies and so forth, but it is important to think about. Um, and, and this can be used. These can be used ill-advisedly that create bad effects. As we've talked about before, parties that have been given you know, by people that don't have good intentions. So... I think it is important to just at least understand that this has been used in many cultures for many years. That said, I want to say it again, um, it is not legal except for ketamine at this time. Ketamine has to be done with a, a medical doctor prescription, so do not use this unless you're in a clinical trial. But we do need to be talking about it as a behavioral health profession, and I hope that we will give this a little more light. And let me know if this is helpful. I thank you for joining in and for all the work that you're doing out there to help folks. Take care.